Hello, my name is David Hill Turner, and I've had a long interest in British Columbia's maritime history, including its underwater heritage. This presentation examines the shipping of coal from Nanaimo in the mid to late 1800s. It was a dangerous coast for sailors, and many ships were lost. The business of moving coal from early Nanaimo to, to Pacific Rim markets is not well known. Most voyages were routine, but some experience more drama, shall we say, than others. It is when a voyage goes wrong that we have an opportunity to learn through newspapers, court reports, inquiries, and other records how the industry worked and the challenges faced by mariners as they pass through our waters. Sadly for many ships and their crews, their story remains untold as they never reach their destination. Coal mining and sailing were both dangerous occupations. Today, no coal is mined on Vancouver Island, but it still remains an important export. In 2017, 29 million tons were shipped through one terminal at Roberts Bank, south of Vancouver. In comparison, Nanaimo's largest mine, the number one Esplanade, produced just 18 million tons over its entire 55 years of production. In the 19th century, 2,200 tons was considered a large cargo on a sailing ship. The average cargo today at Roberts Bank is 100,000 tons. While the technology has changed, the export of coal still relies on miners, railways, and ships. Let's have a look at how the trade developed at Nanaimo. Let's look at how coal mining started at Nanaimo. In 1849, the Hudson's Bay Company began mining coal at Suquash at the north end of Vancouver Island, just south of present-day Port Hardy. It was a new venture for the company. Hudson Bay was more known for fur trade than coal mining. It wasn't a successful venture for many reasons. By 1850, they were aware of coal in Nanaimo but it wasn't until late summer of 1852 that the company started moving miners from Suquash down to present-day Nanaimo area. In September of 1852, the first export of coal happened here at Nanaimo. 480 barrels were mined and transported to waiting ship Cadboro by local Nanaimo people. Over the next decade, more miners were brought to Nanaimo and mines began to expand. Here's a view of downtown Nanaimo, also from 1859. In front of us, we can see the Long Wharf, now present-day Wharf Street, heading out over the subtitle area. Ships could come to the end of the dock for loading. We can also see the first steam engine brought in for the mine. On the left-hand side, it could be used for warming pumps, cutting wood for, for mine timbers, uh, or even as mines got further and further underground, it could be used for pulling out coal carts. In the background is one of the other surviving structures from the coal mine years, the, the bastion. With the success of the early coal mines, more mines were built and more sophisticated mines as new technologies were introduced. Underground, as we can see here without these two men at, at, at a later mine. Uh, on the left hand side we can see a miner with his oil lamp on his on his helmet. And on the right hand side another miner holding a safety lamp. As mines went further underground more technology was used to move the coal and in front of us we can see a coal cart uh, which would be loaded by miners and then pulled perhaps by that steam winch we saw earlier uh, to the surface and then moved to the wharves uh, some distance away. And that became an issue here in Nanaimo. As the mines expanded and were constructed further away from the waterfront, coal had to be transported to the water. The first locomotive arrived here in 1862, and it was one of the first locomotives in Western North America. In this picture here, we can see coal, car, uh, coal train leaving the waterfront. Perhaps it's carrying um, ballast rock. 
uh, been unloaded from the, the, the sailing ships we can see in this picture. It's also interesting to see the number of, uh, of ships in this photo. We can see at least four ships uh, tied up to the dock here in Nanaimo, so it's a busy place. As ships changed and got bigger, and we see more st steamships arriving at the, at the port, we needed uh, longer docks and bigger docks, both to handle the larger ships and also the heavier coal carts that were brought out for loading. In this one, we can see two, at least three sailing ships. And if you look very closely on the left-hand side, we can see the funnel of a steamship loading at Nanaimo. To the north in Departure Bay, Robert Dunsmere and Sons were also building a wharves uh, to export coal from Departure Bay to California. And in this one here, we can see one of the early wharves. And in the bottom, it's quite interesting, we can see a steam locomotive that was used to move the coal from Wellington uh, to the waterfront. One of the early locomotives still exists in Nanaimo, and that's the number 19, located in downtown Piper Park. So we've looked at coal mining and the waterfront, but also what was needed in, in, necessary were reliable and expensive ships to move that coal from Nanaimo to markets. And where did they come from? From the most part from San Francisco. Here there was a lot of large amount of shipping that was available for charter. Ships had come from England, from the East Coast, United States, from Australia and other countries, delivering men and goods to San Francisco. Once here, they were looking for other cargoes, and Nanaimo was one option. Ships were also important to local economies. They used towboats to move them from Cape Flattery uh, to Nanaimo and from Nanaimo back to Cape Flattery. Sometimes one towboat, sometimes two. Pilotage hired pilots, men who were familiar with the coast to provide navigate, navigational advice. Ships needed things. They needed sails, they needed ropes, they needed different supplies, and they could all be purchased at local channelries and other stores. They paid customs fees, so the government made money. They hired men to unload the ships and to load the coal. And lastly, the ships were often here for many weeks, so the men often used local services, hotels, restaurants, pubs, brothels, uh, all benefited from the sailors' docks. At the other end, coal was unloaded, and then we have pictures of two wharves where this happened in, in, in the California area. One of the larger ones was operated by the Dunsmuirs themselves at Oakland on the far side of, of San Francisco Harbor. And here we can see a bark backed in and unloading at the Dunsmuir Wharf. Another gentleman was John Rosenfeld's sons, and they also had a very large uh, coal bunker in downtown San Francisco. John Rosenfeld was very influential in the coal business in Nanaimo. He was an investor in the mines, as well as provided shipping to both the, the the companies in Nanaimo and also to Dunsmuir's companies at Departure Bay. And here we can see here there's an advertisement in a California paper uh, advertising John Rosenfeld's sons. He was a major coal agent on the West Coast, uh, advertising the wharves in Nanaimo, Protection Island, Departure Bay, uh, and also from coal being from Nanaimo, Southfield, and New Wellington because people often had their preferences of where they wanted their coal from. So why were there so many shipwrecks? Well, one is the environment. The BC coast is very rugged. There are strong winds, there are strong currents, fog, uh, all were uh, caused wrecks at various times. There were human errors that were made in navigation. And lastly, in the early days, there weren't very, very many aids to navigation. Many of the charts used by captains were over 90 years old and had been created by George Vancouver in the 1790s. Very few lights were installed. There were navigational buoys along the way. And all these at various times would provide uh, an opportunity, shall we say, for an accident. 
So where did these voyages begin once they arrived in BC? Well, there's only one way in for Nanaimo, and that's via Tatoosh Island at off Cape Flattery. So ships come from the south would be looking for this light as they came from uh, as they approached Juan de Fuca Strait. In the background on the left hand side we can see Cape Flattery. Ships would come in off here quite often. There'd be a towboat uh, circling, and the captain and the towboat would negotiate a price being towed to Nanaimo or Burrard Inlet or Victoria, wherever the ship had to go. It was often a very unforgiving place. A lot of water moves out so straight of one fuga every day with an ebb tide, and sometimes coupled with winds, we had very, very dangerous conditions off of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. So sailing ships masters were often very relieved to see a towboat there uh, who could take them and tow them in much more safely and quicker than they could do under sail themselves. As sailing ships got bigger and, and transitioned from being of wood hulls to iron hulls, towboats for them also got bigger. As we can see this one, one of the biggest on the coast at the time, the Lorne, uh, heading out to uh, pick up a tow off of Cape Flattery. So where did these ships come in? As I mentioned earlier, Cape Flattery, which is over on the left-hand side, just above Blue Star. Uh, a ship would be engaged there. If it was a sailing ship by a towboat, if it's a steamship, they would come in on their own power. They'd move in. Luckily, if they had the tide with them, it would be a relatively easy journey up the Strait of Juan de Fuca, past Victoria, Harrow Strait, Boundary Pass, up the Strait of Georgia to Nanaimo. It's a journey of about 100 miles, and it could take anywhere from 10 to maybe three days uh, to complete, depending on weather, tide, uh, and, and the power of the, of the towboat itself. Let's learn about a few of the ships that called at Nanaimo. The Panther, unfortunately we don't have a photograph of her, or a painting even of the Panther, was regarded as a fast, well-built sailing ship. She was launched at Medford, Massachusetts in 1854. The Panther was 198 feet long, 28 feet wide with a draft of 24 and a half feet. As you can see from this advertisement, she was a world sailor. Her hull carried some of the first railway iron from England to India. It carried grain from Australia to San Francisco, gold seekers from New York to San Francisco, and of course, coal from Nanaimo to San Francisco. The Panther had throughout her life a very successful history. On the West Coast, she was owned by Pope and Talbot and often carried lumber from its sawmill port Gamble, Washington. By 1873, though, she was in regular service transporting coal between Nanaimo and San Francisco. And in that year, between September and December, she made three round trips between the cities. On her final voyage, the Panther departed in Nanaimo on January 17, 1874, with a cargo of 1,750 tons of coal. Captain Balch, a regular master, had even brought his wife what he thought would be an uneventful trip. In speed, Captain Balch had secured the tug Goliath for the tow to Cape Flattery. Goliath was also owned by Pope and Talbot. Goliath's master, Captain Libby, was familiar with the tug, the second, pur second purpose-built towboat in, in America. And he was also very familiar with the route that the, the Goliath would follow between Nanaimo and Cape Flattery. That afternoon, as the tug and tow made their way south to the Strait of Georgia and into Boundary Pass, a southeasterly blew up, and by 8.30 that evening, visibility was limited by heavy snow and the mass and the rigging of the Panther were creating a dangerous situation for the Goliath as the ship began to pull it north towards the rocks of Tilly Point on South Pender Island. Captain Libby had no choice but ordered the hawser connecting his ship to the Panther be cut. In an instant, the ship was lost in the driving snow. The next morning, the tug returned to look for the lost tow on South Pender, but it was not to be found. After an unsuccessful search, 
he headed to Port Townsend to report the loss of the ship and crew. It was a remarkable story of the Panther, as we can see here, where apparently he was approximately uh, uh, cut free from, from the Tug Goliath, according to Captain Libby, just south of, of Tilly Point on South Pender Island. It is remarkable that Captain Libby and the crew, uh, Captain, sorry, rather Captain Balsner's crew avoided the many islands and reefs as they drifted north on almost zero visibility to the driving snow. He did report that ships struck rocks and he did attempt to, to beach the Panther on Salt Spring Island, but she was pushed back into Trincomalee Channel and onto a reef at the south end of Wallace Island. The crew made it safely to shore the following morning. Pope and Talbot attempted to salvage their ship, but abandoned the project after removing sails, masts, rigging, and anything else that was movable. The Panther was the first of a project uh, conducted by UBC in 1976 uh, and with a group of uh, sport divers who had come to form the Underwater Archaeological Society of BC. And we can see here the location of the wreck on Panther Point at the south end of Wallace Island with Salt Spring Island in the distance. As was the custom at the time when a ship was lost, the ship and cargo were often sold at auction. And here we can see in, in the, the Daily Colonist a newspaper an ad for the sale of the Panther as she lay in a narrow island, as Wallace Island was then called, uh, her cargo and everything else on board her. Steamships were also not immune to the weather and currents of our coast. The Barnard Castle was built in England and was launched in 1876. She had been sailing on the west coast since 1881, mostly under charter to Dunsmuir and Sons. The Dunsmuirs purchased the ship in October of 1886. The Barnard Castle departed Departure Bay on the morning of November 20th, 1886. She was on her second voyage under Dunsmuir ownership and was carrying 2,300 tons of coal for San Francisco. Hours later, just off Discovery Island near Victoria, Captain Urquhart gave the final course to the first officer and retired. With instructions to call him when they were abreast of Race Rocks, 16 kilometers southwest of Victoria, and a well-known hazard to navigation because of the fog and strong currents in the early days of shipping. Perhaps due to the currents or inattention, the ship struck an outlying rock at Race Rocks. Urquhart, noting the time at 6.45 a.m., ordered damage survey and set a course for a squamount. The water, however, was coming in faster and the boiler fires could, and pumps could handle. Urquhart aimed for the nearest place he'd seen beach, where he could beach his wounded ship, Pilot Bay on Bentic Island. As the ship settled into the mud, trapped air in the holds blew off the hatches, sending wood, canvas, and coal high above the ship. Be because of the exposed location, salvage divers could do very little but remove some of the equipment. It is said locals were well supplied with coal all winter. As winter storms battered the ship, she was reduced to a wreck. The remaining cargo and ship were auctioned off in the summer of 1887. A San Francisco salvage company eventually removed the engine, machinery, and anything else of value. In the 1990s, the Barnard Castle was surveyed by the Underwater Archaeological Society BC, and later an interpretive trail for divers was created. Today, like all shipwrecks in BC, it is protected under provincial legislation. The wreck is one of several that have underwater commemorative plaques, and we can see here divers doing a bay of the Barnard Castle, and we can see some features of the ship. Launched in 1851, the Erickson was an unusual ship. The ship was a clock powered rather than steam. The original ship used engines that ran on hot air. The largest cylinder in this engine was 14 feet in diameter. The engine was very safe and efficient, but was underpowered at just 300 horsepower. 
It was converted to steam in 1854 and then to a sailing ship in 1868. In her career, she also served as an armed escort during the American Civil War and as a funeral ship for U.S. President James Monroe. The Ericsson was designed by John Ericsson, a Swedish mechanical engineer. He's also known for two things, the design of the screw propeller, and if you can see below his right hand here, the USS Monitor, uh, the famed ship from the American Civil War. In 1892, inbound to Nanaimo from San Francisco, the ship was caught in a strong gale and was carried into the night onto the rocks at Folger Island uh, in Barclay Sound and was stranded there. Captain J.J. Bennett managed to reach Bamfield to get the assistance of a tug. While a suitable tug was not available, the captain and crew were able to salvage sails, other movable equipment, before being forced to leave due to, due to deteriorating weather. The Ericsson's owned by John Rosenfeld and Sons was under charter to Robert Dunsmuir. And we can see here some examples of the, of the construction of the, the, uh, the Rosenfeld uh, with divers of ASBC. Uh, many of the artifacts you see here that were surveyed and tagged uh, have since gone into the collection of maritime museums. It's also very unusual that it was one of the first and only shipwrecks on the west coast of, of Canada to have a postage stamp issued in 1986, as we can see here uh, in this, this particular example. And as of many of the ships and many of them associated with NIMO, they do have a commemorative plaque with a bit of history for divers and also reminding divers that underwater wrecks are protected under the Heritage Conservation Act. The 256-foot sailing ship, a classic of marine architecture, John Rosenfeld was just two years old when she struck an uncharted rock off Saturna Island's East Point. She depart departed Departure Bay with a cargo of 3,905 tons of coal on February 19, 1886. It was the largest shipment of coal ever to have been loaded at a BC port. She was behind the big tug Tacoma but its mate became disoriented by the mist on the Canadian side of the Boundary Pass and cut the corner a bit too tight. The tug came to an abrupt stop as a Rosenfeld rode up and became firmly lodged on a rock that would come to bear her name. Soundings show 20 feet under the ship. The Tacoma just drew 12 feet, but the lo loaded Rosenfeld more than 26 feet. As the tide fell and Captain James Baker realized his ship would be a total loss, she was quickly put up for sale. Sails, rigging, machinery, and other, any other movable items, including coal, were loaded onto the beaver, and she sat on the rock for another five years before breaking up and sinking. The Rosenfeld was under the charter to the Dunsmuir and Sons. Here we can see just after the stranding of, of the Rosenfelds, a very unusual picture for the time uh, of the Rosenfelds sitting on Rosenfeld Rock. And the passengers look, well, and the crew look very unconcerned. They're sitting here just as they're sitting on the deck of a boat, waiting for something to happen. And in the back, we can see the tug waiting to take them off. You can see the fine construction of the ship. And as it was almost new, uh, it is a superb example of, of mid, uh, 20th century, 19th century naval architecture. It looks very calm here on the side of the Rosen, site of the Rosenfeld today, but looking nearby, we can see a sign called what the nearby reef called Boiling Reef. Gives you an idea that things aren't always as calm at this point on Saturna Island. As mentioned earlier, uh, the standing rigging masts and everything were sold. Uh, at auction in Victoria. Our last ship we're going to look at is the Thrasher. She was a big steel hull bark. Launched in 1876, the Thrasher was owned by investors in Bath, Maine. This included Captain Bosworth, her master at the time of her grounding. Before entering the coal trade, the Thrasher may have been in the whaling trade. By 1880, however, she was carrying coal between Nanaimo and San Francisco. 
there are two really stories about uh, the this the, the wreck of the, of the Thrasher. One is, of course, the navigating local waters, and the other one is its role in a very complex legal case that developed here in British Columbia. The Thrasher was towed from Royal Roads to Departure Bay to Lobe Coal on July 14, 1880, after a negotiation between Captain Bosworth and the master of the tugs Etta White and Beaver, they agreed to tow him to a point 11 miles off Cape Flattery. The tugs were not his first choice, but the only ones available at that day, on that day. As the tugs departed from Nanaimo with the Thrasher in tow, Captain Bosworth advised the helm to follow the Etta White, the lead tug, and retired to his cabin. At 9.30 p.m., she grounded on an uncharted rock uh, that was part of the Gabriola Reef. The Tobo captains claimed they were not responsible as they were unaware of its existence. Charts were still primitive. The, the ship was declared a loss and was sold to J.F. Engelhardt of Victoria for $500 for the ship and $50 for what remained of the 2,600 tons of coal. But the story does not end there. What sets this wreck apart from others is a long case connected with its loss that dragged through the British and Canadian courts. As the uninsured ship was at value $80,000, the owners sought compensation from the owners of the two tugs. While defeated in the BC Supreme Court and the BC Appeal Court, both under Chief Justice Sir Matthew Bailey Begbie, they were successful at the Supreme Court of Canada. The defendants were then granted his appeal to the Imperial Privy Council in London, and two Victoria lawyers were dispatched to argue the case in 1884. However, the, the, the defendants, the owners of the two tugboat companies, lost. The Thrasher also became a maritime law case in which the dispute between the province judiciary and the executive of the province over the right to set the judiciary schedule, led by Chief Justice Sir Matthew Bailey Begbie, overshadowed the rights of the litigants, in this case, uh, the ship's owners. Another historical note, the Thrasher's lawyer, Theodore Davy, was elected to the BC Legislature and became Attorney General in 1889 and the Premier in 1892. In 1895, he became the Chief Justice of British Columbia and succeeded his, his adversary, adversary in, the, in the earlier case, Chief Justice Sir Matthew Bailey Begbie. If you want to learn more about many of the shipwrecks in British Columbia, two good sources are Shipwrecks of British Columbia by Fred Rogers and also a series of regional shipwreck reports uh, developed by the Underwater Archaeological Society of British Columbia. And thank you too for uh, your presence today and also for participating in our experiment as the first in a series of online lectures by the Nanaimo Historical Society.